Chatsworth is located in the San Fernando Valley, the suburbs of Los Angeles, California, and was once home to several distinct Native American tribes, some of whom left rock art in caves on cliffs, which were explored and colonized by the Spanish beginning in the 18th century. Today, I found myself driving by Stony Point Park, located near the north end of Topanga Canyon Boulevard in Chatsworth, and I decided to take a hike to the top. I wasn't really dressed for hiking today, especially in 94 degree heat, but I had just come from a doctor's visit and was told that I needed to do something about my high cholesterol and that lifting the fork to my mouth at restaurants did not count as rigorous exercise. So as it turns out, the trails here are a lot steeper than I expected. So I thought that it would be wise to practice climbing some of these smaller boulders first, just to get warmed up and to take in some of the scenery. Now that I'm getting older, I decided to start taking better care of my health, and so I'm determined to make it to the top today. No matter how difficult it is, I won't let anything sway me. And even though I already broke a sweat from the heat, and I've never tried this before, there's absolutely no way I'm turning back, because I made up my mind, and I will overcome any obstacle that I encounter along my path to the top. Okay, you know what? I just changed my mind. There's a very angry looking snake on this path. So maybe it's best that I reconsider and try climbing up another way. Some of my friends have asked me to join their gym to help get me into shape, but it's not for me. I'd rather be out in nature than on a treadmill running in the same spot staring at a TV set. And there's just nothing like a good hike, especially when at the end you're rewarded with a beautiful and scenic view from the top. Living in America, I think a lot about the ancient cultures that lived here before me, that may have climbed these same rocks in antiquity. The people that historians and anthropologists call Native Americans. In the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the term Native is defined as an original or indigenous inhabitant. In the same dictionary, the term indigenous is defined as, quote, relating to the earliest known inhabitants of a place and especially of a place that was colonized by a now dominant group. In the context of the peopling of the Americas, the now dominant colonizers are, of course, the Europeans that officially started arriving in 1492, the year that Jews were expelled from Europe. Of course, Christopher Columbus was himself known to be a converso, meaning he openly converted to Christianity while secretly maintaining his original faith. His voyage was financed to a large degree by three prominent Jewish conversos, and at least a third of the crew members on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria were Jews, all of which can be fact-checked online. It is also interesting to note that Columbus officially set sail on the morning of August 3rd 1492, the very morning after 
according to Chabad.org, a Jewish website that cites, quote, the last Jews left Spain on August 2nd, 1492. The validity of these statements can be attested to anthropologically by the plethora of centuries-old tombstones that can still be found in Jamaica with Hebrew writing next to skull and bone symbology, which I already explained the occult meaning of in prior videos about the Knights Templar. That said, the alleged discovery of the Americas by Christopher Columbus was not by accident through seeking a direct water route west from Europe to Asia, but rather for new land to be settled by conversos who traced their ancestry back to Canaanites who were well aware of the Americas for many millennia. Spanish Jews were called Sephardic, as Sephardic means Spain in Hebrew and had a long history of trade with ancient Phoenicia, which is the Greek word for the land of Canaan. Alexander the Great crushed the Phoenician capital of Tyre, and the Roman Empire eradicated the Phoenician colony of Carthage in the Punic Wars, which is why modern history books, which are all based on the Greco-Roman version of history, leaves out the true story of the Phoenicians and Canaanites, as well as the Israelites and certain Egyptian dynasties, who are also all aware of the Americas since antiquity during the era of the Roman Empire, as well as their extension, the Holy Roman Empire, or Catholic Church, anything to do with the conquered Phoenicians, which means red in Greek, was hidden or vilified. That's why Satan, which means adversary, was always depicted in red, horned, and holding a trident, all symbols of their conquered adversary, who were forced to go underground. The Phoenicians were not one distinct isolated nation, but rather, collectively, followers of an ancient tradition which can be traced back thousands of years to the Pleistocene, which is the time that the ancient Egyptians and Greeks attributed to Atlantis, which even during the Ice Age was said to be involved in transatlantic settlements. The Catholic Church extended their Inquisition, which is another word for genocide, to the Americas, where they exterminated the Phoenician descendants that had fled there during the Punic Wars and, in modern times, banned their ancient symbol, the swastika, which was also revered by the Vikings, who also sailed to the Americas before Christopher Columbus and were also affiliated with the Phoenicians. Crazy Horse was a Lakota war leader born in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1841, the son of a Sioux shaman. The Lakota are a Native American tribe, one of the three main subcultures of the Sioux people. Crazy Horse had a lighter complexion and hair than others in his tribe, with prodigious curls. Boys were traditionally not permanently named until they had an experience that earned them a name, so Crazy Horse was called Curly Hair and Light Haired Boy as a child. As an adolescent, Crazy Horse earned the name His Horse Looking, but he was more commonly known as Curly until 1858 when, following a battle with Arapaho warriors, he was given his father's name while his father took the name Worm. Crazy Horse was not a traditionalist with regard to his tribe's customs, shrugging off many of the traditions and rituals that the Sioux practiced. In 1854, Crazy Horse rode off into the prairies for a vision quest, purposefully ignoring the required rituals. Fasting for two days, Crazy Horse had a vision of an unadorned horseman who directed him to present himself in the same way, 
with no more than one feather and never a war bonnet. He was also told to toss dust over his horse before entering battle and to place a stone behind his ear and directed to never take anything for himself. Crazy Horse followed these instructions until his death. Black Buffalo Woman was Crazy Horse's first love. They met in 1857, but she married a man named No Water while Crazy Horse was on a raid. Crazy Horse continued to pay her attention and in 1868 eloped with her while No Water was on a hunting party. He and Black Buffalo Woman spent one night together before No Water took back his wife, shooting Crazy Horse in the nose and breaking his jaw. Despite fears of violence between villages, the two men came to a truce. Crazy Horse insisted that Black Buffalo Woman shouldn't be punished for fleeing and received a horse from No Water in compensation for the injury. Crazy Horse eventually married Black Shawl, who died of tuberculosis, and later a half Cayenne, half French woman named Nellie Larrabee. Black Buffalo Woman's fourth child, a girl, was a light-skinned baby suspected of being the result of her night with Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was involved in many battles. The most famous was probably when he led as many as 1,000 warriors against General Custer, helping seal the general's disastrous defeat and death at the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand. Five of the 7th Cavalry's 12 companies were annihilated and Custer was killed. The total U.S. casualty count included 268 dead and 55 severely wounded, with six dying later from their wounds. Crazy Horse eventually negotiated a deal, essentially surrendering in exchange for the Sioux to get their own reservation. During negotiations, Crazy Horse found trouble with both the army and his fellow tribesmen and was arrested, dying shortly after at the age of 35 during a struggle with an old friend that worked for the army and the soldier. Crazy Horse is remembered for his courage, leadership, and his tenacity of spirit in the face of near impossible odds. His legacy is celebrated in the Crazy Horse Memorial, an uncompleted monumental sculpture located in the Black Hills, not far from Mount Rushmore, and likely to be one of the largest sculptures in the world when completed. The Sioux tribe once lived as woodland Indians along the upper Mississippi and Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. They were forced west by the French and their Chippewa allies. During the migration west to the Great Plains, the tribe split into three divisions, the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, which were the people's names for themselves. The name Sioux actually means little snakes, which was given to the tribe by the Chippewa Indians. Archaeological, linguistic, and genetic studies indicate that the peopling of the Americas happened in several different waves during different time periods and that the populations were ethnically and racially diverse rather than one homogenous group. While my previous videos have focused on transatlantic settlers from Vikings, Celts, Phoenicians, Maritime Archaic or better known as the Red Paint People and even Ice Age seafaring populations genetically related to the European Basque people that used Solutrean bifacial stone tools. It could be said that evidence exists that seafaring people also arrived by boat on the Pacific side of the North American continent. And although mainstream anthropologists still mostly cling to the Bering Strait land route as the main path from Asia to the New World, more and more archaeologists are finding reason to believe that boats hugging the coastline were also likely used, with the ocean itself being used as an ancient highway by migrating tribes of various ethnicities well into the Pleistocene or Ice Age. Archaeologists in Canada unearthed an Ice Age settlement that may rewrite North American history.
It's a story that has been passed down from generation to generation amongst the Hiltzuk nation. Indeed, it forms part of the oral history of the Canadian people. Yet the narrative it portrays has challenged widespread conceptions about the human migration in North America. And now, incredibly, archaeologists have found stunning evidence to prove it. Some 14,000 years ago, the North American continent was in the grip of an ice age. As a result, glaciers covered most of the land. Scientists have long believed that it was during this period that the first humans crossed into North America, traveling on foot across a land bridge between what is now Alaska and eastern Russia before moving further south via inland routes. However, a new discovery in northwestern Canada has challenged that belief. The story that the Hiltzuk people told concerned a strip of land along the west coast of Canada. In contrast to accepted scientific wisdom, their traditions claimed that this piece of land didn't freeze during the Ice Age. Consequently, they say, it was here that their ancestors took shelter from the freezing conditions. And as a result of these Hiltzuk beliefs, archaeologists recently turned their attention to an island called Trickett in British Columbia. The team that made the incredible find consisted of researchers from a number of different institutions. They included local First Nations groups, as well as the University of Victoria and the Hekai Institute. Together, the team members headed to Trickett Island to ascertain whether the Hiltzuk stories were rooted in fact. To begin with, the expedition had to dig down through layers of soil and peat. Then, after cutting through several feet of earth, the researchers came upon Palisol. This is a thin layer of fossil soil, and its discovery intrigued archaeologists. However, it wasn't the earth itself that was of interest, but rather what the soil contained. Within the parasol, the researchers subsequently discovered the remains of an ancient, earth-like structure. What's more, inside that hearth, there were minuscule flecks of charcoal. Painstakingly, using tweezers, the team extracted these tiny pieces of burnt wood. When the fragments had finally been pulled out, they were taken off and carbon dated, and the results of these tests were astounding. When the results came back, they confirmed the oral history of a Hiltzuk nation. The settlement had been established around 14,000 years ago. The spit of land that the First Nation people had been telling stories about for so long had been found, and there were further revelations to come. Alongside the charcoal fragments, the archaeologists found a number of other incredible items. For example, there were fish hooks and tools, while nearby the researchers discovered spears that would have been used to hunt marine mammals. There were also a hand drill which could have been utilized to start the fire that produced the charcoal. To put the discovery into some historical context, the settlement found on Trickett Island is thousands of years older than the Egyptian pyramids, it predates the Roman Empire as well, in fact, it was around when animals such as mammoths still walked the earth. And now, it's reshaping how scientists think the Asian originating ancestors of some Native American tribes first arrived in North America. Until recently, the dominant theory was that after crossing on foot from what we now call Siberia, these early humans made their way south on foot along a route to the east of the Rockies. However, Doubts have arisen regarding this hypothesis. For example, scientists have questioned whether there could be enough resources for ancestors to survive such an inland journey. And indeed, the find on Trickett Island suggests another explanation. It had long been held that the coast would have been uninhabitable during this period, but the evidence uncovered on Trickett Island seems to have shattered that belief. It does even more than that, though. In fact, it suggests that one of the earliest human migrations into North America wasn't made by land, but that our ancestors instead used the sea to make their first forays into the continent. And thanks to the items found at Trickett, archaeologists have evidence to support that idea. It seems that the ancestors of the Hiltzuk nation 
could have been capable of moving along the coast of the land bridge into North America. What's more, from there it appears that they continued to move deeper into the continent along the coast rather than by land. It was the spears that gave archaeologists this insight, as the weapons were clearly used to hunt large marine mammals. As a result, the researchers could conclude that these people must have been capable of taking to the waves. Other discoveries at the site have added even more credence to this theory. For example, one of the key pieces of evidence revolved around the diet of the Trickett inhabitants. Indeed, further tests conducted on materials found at the dig indicate that for the first 7,000 years of human habitation, the diet on Trickett consisted primarily of seals and sea lions. This further supported the belief that the inhabitants of the island were capable seafarers. And through this insight, combined with the carbon dating, a new picture of early migration to North America started to appear. Moreover, one additional piece of evidence really added credence to this new theory. It didn't relate to the people living on Trickett Island though. Instead, it was about the island itself. Researchers uncovered an important fact about Trickett that pointed to it having been habitable even when the rest of the continent was encased in ice. The evidence they uncovered showed that the sea level at Trickett had been constant for more than 15,000 years. This degree of stability would, of course, have been vital in terms of making the island habitable for humans. Furthermore, it tallies well with the stories of the Hiltzik nation. So now, we don't just have oral history, we have this archaeological information, William Hausty, a member of the Hiltzik nation, told CBS News. It's not just an arbitrary thing that anyone's making up. We have a history supported from Western science and archaeology. And while the discoveries at Trickett Island are changing the way the scientists think about the way the New World was populated, they also demonstrate that oral history can be just as strongly rooted in fact as any other type of record. On a small piece of land on the west coast of Canada, archaeologists are rewriting history and it's all thanks to an oral tradition that proved to be absolutely true. That said, the first modern human shows up in the fossil record around 35,000 years ago and other hominids such as Neanderthal, Homo erectus, Denisovan, and anything else you come across is not considered modern, even if it walks upright, has two arms, two legs, a head, and has other anatomically correct features. The species associated with the term modern first populated Europe around 35,000 years ago, and genetic testing on Cro-Magnon types have indicated it was nearly identical to certain European populations we see living there today. So, there's a big problem with the theory that Sub-Saharan African populations left Africa and instantaneously and magically mutated into modern Europeans. And this goes beyond skin color, as this would also require a dramatic change in bone structure of the skull, prognathism, and other physical phenotype features such as hair, but more importantly, it is ruled out genetically as sub-Saharan populations have been shown through genetic sequencing to contain DNA from hominids that are not contained in non-sub-Saharan African populations, such as Asians and Caucasians, and vice versa, meaning Asians and Caucasians have been found to have genetics that are found only in trace amounts in sub-Saharan populations, such as Neanderthal DNA. I say trace amounts because it happened the other way around. Sub-Saharan Africans did not populate Europe and interbreed with Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal there. However, Cro-Magnon interbred with Neanderthal in Europe and then entered Africa and had offspring with species which then became modern Sub-Saharan populations. Scientists call this a ghost species as they have determined this through genetics and have yet to identify the hominid in the fossil record. But most studies speculate that it was Homo erectus or Homo habilis, 
which are 1.8 million years removed from other Cro-Magnon or modern humans. So that leaves us with the question, where did Cro-Magnon come from, if not Sub-Saharan Africa? Or where did modern humans first come from, such as the Basques, who, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, are the direct descendants of Cro-Magnon, who are currently living in the same place where Cro-Magnon was discovered. The Basque have among the highest concentration of Rh-negative blood on Earth, a fact that I've discussed in my books and other popular videos, which I'll include a link to in the description, and that have explained that this blood type originates with Cro-Magnon. While it is true that Rh negative has also been found in some very late Neanderthal specimen as well, please keep in mind that Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal interbred for about 7,000 years, and those were hybrids, as older Neanderthal specimens have not only been shown to be Rh positive, but they were not even recessive carriers of Rh negative blood. When we look at this map showing the distribution of haplogroup X, a genetic marker found mostly in ancient Europeans or Cro-Magnon types, it draws our attention to the other side of the Atlantic as well, where just this morning I was interested to read this article, which has a headline that reads, First humans may have reached the Americas and settled in Mexico 15,000 years earlier than previous thought, studies show. Now, the earliest accepted arrival date for the peopling of the Americas is currently about 15,000 years ago, which is slightly after the Clovis era. Clovis is a type of bifacial stone tool technology, similar to the Solutrean spear tips found in Europe. The dating of this settlement is based on coprolite found in what are known as the Paisley Caves in Oregon, presuming that the settlers arrived along the Bering Strait from Alaska and Siberia. I'll go ahead and translate that for you. Coprolite is the scientific term for ancient poop. So they discovered some 15,000 year old poop in a cave in Oregon and established that as evidence for the earliest arrival of Native Americans into North America. And that was taught to me when I was in school. Of course, for those familiar with my work, I've demonstrated that there are stone tools found along the east coast of the US that have been chemically tested to come from France, as well as numerous remains which are considered the oldest found in North America that have European ancestry. That said, this morning's article references finds made in Mesoamerica, more specifically a cave in Mexico, revealing that humans arrived on the continent 33,000 years ago, a time period which closely resembles the first modern human arrival in Western Europe with Cro-Magnon. The article says that, quote, researchers do not know exactly how people first reached Americas at this time. And that makes sense as they remain baffled as they are conditioned to think only in terms of an obsolete theory which predates the sequencing of the human and other hominid genomes and insists all origins must, must come from Sub-Saharan Africa. This old, politically motivated, and racist theory relies on missing links in the hopes of linking humanity to mutating monkeys, despite the fact that this does not pan out in the fossil or genetic record. It also does not present itself in any known mythology from any culture around the world. No race traces their origins from primates. That said, the archaeology, fossil record, genetic record, and mythology of many cultures on both sides of the Atlantic speak to an origin from an island during the Pleistocene when sea levels were 400 feet lower likely situated in the Atlantic, where during the Ice Age, the Azores Islands would have been largely exposed and above water. It is also interesting to note that from my research, the oldest archaeological sites in the New World appear in South America rather than North America, which is also counterintuitive if one were to presume the Americas were first populated from Siberia 
coming via Alaska. With that in mind, I'll read a bit from the article. Quote, Archaeologists have rewritten the history books for when humans first arrived in the Americas, shifting the date of the initial migration 15,000 years back in time. Excavations in a cave in Mexico called Chicahuti revealed archaeological evidence of human occupation dating back up to 27,000 years. But computer analysis further pushes this date back with the study claiming people first lived in the cave around 33,000 years ago. This is in clear contradiction to the widely accepted belief that humans did not reach North America until around 16,000 years ago. Academics agree that humans most likely migrated from Asia to the Americas via a land bridge across the Bering Strait, which is now underwater and forms the sea between Alaska and Russia. However, during the Ice Age, which started around 33,000 years ago and lasted until around 16,000 years ago, this route was blocked by glaciers. It was previously thought that people first crossed over to the Americas after the Ice Age, when the glaciers had melted, and most of the archaeological evidence discovered before now supports this theory. However, the Chikahuti Cave indicates humans had already been on the continent for millennia, more than 30,000 years ago. Today, two studies are published in Nature, one detailing the site of Chikahuti and another statistically analyzing 42 archaeological sites in the Americas. Nearly 2,000 stone tools were found in the Mexican cave over a 10-year study period, and their age was calculated using radiocarbon analysis. Using the archaeological evidence and Bayesian age modeling, a powerful tool that incorporates dates and archaeological evidence through statistics, we can estimate humans arrived at Chikahuti Cave as early as 33,000 years ago. These findings help us understand the initial human occupation of the Americas in greater detail than ever before. Professor Tom Higgum from the University of Oxford, who was involved in the research, advocates the theory that the surprisingly early movement occurred via the seas. The people that traveled into these new lands must have used maritime technology because the northern parts of North America were impenetrable and sealed off from eastern Eurasia by a massive ice sheet until 13,000 years ago, he says. While the researchers postulate on how humans reached the Mexican cave, they believe the site itself offers irrefutable evidence of human habitation. Dr. Cyprian Ardalan who led the archaeological excavation says, quote, The finds at Chikahuti Cave are extremely exciting. The archaeology is older than anything we've seen before, and the stone tools are of a type that is unique to the Americas. Human made flaked stone artifacts are there by the thousands, embedded in layered sedimentary deposits that are now well dated. Dr. Jean Luc Schweiniger, senior co author of the paper on the excavations, says the publication of the research is very satisfying and will challenge long-established views. He says that to formulate such a bold new theory required extra amounts of diligence, scrutiny, patience, and perseverance. Professor Grun agrees that the findings will ruffle feathers and spark a lively debate into when the Americas were first reached by humans. Writing an accompanying news and views article also published in Nature, Professor Grun says, quote, The suggestion that the initial entry date was as far back as 33,000 years ago, which is more than double the currently popular date of around 16,000 years ago, will be very hard for most archaeologists specializing in early America to accept. That said, I've recently uploaded a video which explores some of the mythology regarding Atlantis, as well as supporting evidence for this possibility as an alternative starting point for the peopling of Europe as well as the Americas, as well as the diffusion of civilization into the Holocene or our current age. And while some of these pre-Columbian discoveries may be considered new by modern academia, the ancient idea of a global diffusion of civilization that revered symbolism 
pertaining to serpents and other esoteric motifs are anything but new to secret societies and authors that have studied the occult. Officially, America is named after the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, but this appears doubtful, like so much of American history, which has transformed a one-time pirate of the family name Griego into an iconic hero named Christopher Columbus. As for America, according to Manley Hall, America is named after the Plumed Serpent, who is the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and in Peru he was called Amaru. From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. As this plumed serpent was a messenger of the sun, he was also a light bearer. The serpent is one of the most enigmatic symbols on earth. It has played a part in religious symbolism throughout the world. Sometimes good, a symbol of wisdom, spirit, and regeneration. Other times as a symbol of darkness, death, and material power. In some cultures, such as the Hebrew, it is both, symbolizing knowledge and evil, wisdom and death. Christ exhorts us to be wise as serpents, but also guileless as doves. In other words, partake of the serpent's wisdom, but not his nature. Exactly what the founders envisioned when they named America, we may only guess, but perhaps Aleister Crowley can provide us a clue. Casting light on a number of symbols, in one very potent paragraph, he said, This serpent, Satan, is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. He bade, Know thyself, and taught initiation. He is the devil of the Book of Thoth, and his emblem is Baphomet, the androgyne, who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. But moreover, his letter is Ion, the eye. He is light, and his zodiacal image is Capricornus, that leaping goat whose attribute is liberty. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.